And now, coming to you live from the City of Angels, Los Angeles, California, it's the Sheena Metal Experience with your host, Sheena Metal, only on KGRA Digital Broadcasting. Welcome to the Sheena Metal Experience on KGRA Digital Broadcasting Network. I'm your host, Sheena Metal. I'm a psychic medium. I'm an interfaith minister. I'm a 29-year talk radio host in Los Angeles and beyond. I'm a creative and a performing artist. And I come to you live from my home in Southern California every Friday at 3 o'clock Pacific time. This show is about spirituality. It's about creativity. It's about humanity. It's about passion. It's about service. It's about becoming and then being your absolute best you in this big, beautiful world and then inspiring others to do the same. And every week on the show, it may be my show, but it's always without a doubt your experience. My guest today has been on so many of my shows so many times. I can't even count, but it's the very first time here. Um, Wonderfully talented uh, writer, director, producer, Uh, spiritual being, creative being, and one of my favorite people in the whole world. Uh, Please welcome to the show. The wonderful Catherine Brooks is here. How are you, my friend? Creative being. I like that. You are. And a spiritual being, right? You are both. And we have discussed both even before I came out of the psychic closet. um, We had many spiritual discussions on the air. We talked about this kind of stuff. I love it. Yeah. I, I don't know. For me, I can't imagine being a creative without being spiritual. I know there are people that do it and I respect that. But for me, that channel brings everything. So it's all part of the same thing, you know? Absolutely. And, it, and you know, it's funny because I'm kind of on a journey right now and I know you are too. And we have not been in touch for a little while. And you just recently reconnected with me to talk about your journey. And I think in some ways we're on a bit of a similar journey of figuring out where we come from and family and what, where we're going next and what that means. So why don't you talk a little bit real quick about, you know, what you've been going through? Well, I, um, Michelle, my wife got me a DNA, uh, test kit from 23 and me over Christmas. And I, I'm adopted and I had searched, uh most of my life for my birth mother um probably around the age of 15 i started looking for her and just it never happened and around my 35th birthday i i just i had to let it go because i it was just like i would I, I couldn't handle just the disappointment of not being able to find her. And I was like, it was a private adoption. It was done through a lawyer. So anyway, I'd let that go. Uh, and Michelle got me this test and she wanted to do it more to find out like genetically, like, you know, am I prone to breast cancer? Am I? So sure. I, I did it not thinking anything about it. And I got the results in February of this year. And it connected me to two, like I hundreds of relatives, <laughs> but but two first cousins. Wow. And okay. yeah, two first cousins. And I reached out to one of them because the other one had passed, reached out to her. And about a week later, she contacted me and we got on a text together. And we were just talking back and forth. And she was like, what's your story? I said, well, I was adopted. I was born in Baton Rouge. And 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 we talked maybe like five or 10 minutes about that. And she said, I think I know who your mother is. I think I know who your birth mother is. Wow. And um, she said, and sent me a picture. And I saw the picture and I was just, pretty blown away. And she's like, are you open? Do you think you would want to talk to her? I was like, yeah. Um, But it happened so fast because she, while we're on the text, she went silent for like five minutes. And she said, "Um, 
I found her. I gave her your birth date. It's your birth mother. And she wants to call you. Wow. <laughs> and, wow. uh, I just, I honestly, I started, I, I, I started like getting very nervous and emotional. And so I gave the phone to my wife <laughs> and I said, I, I can't do this. I'm, I'm too nervous. And like a kid, like a little girl, like ran out onto our deck and my wife spoke to her first and, uh, came out on the deck where I was and just said, you need, you know, you need to talk to her. And I got on the phone with her and she was crying and she's like, I, I never wanted to give you up. I was 15. Yeah. Uh, my dad was a Colonel in the military and I wanted to keep you. They sent me away to a school for pregnant unwed moms when I was 15. And they, she said, I was just under the impression. I, I just always, I didn't know what pregnancy was. She's like, she was just telling me all these things. And, and I just, yeah, it was, it was so intense. And then I was in LA at the time. Well, I was here for a week hiatus on a show that I was directing in Los Angeles. So while this is happening, I'm directing that Magnolia show that I just did. So while I'm directing that I'm in LA in March, she flies out and we spend eight days together. Wow. And I meet her. So it's just been, and cause it's only, we're in August. So it's like very, it's all very. Yeah. Recent. So new. Yeah. yeah. So it's, it's just been a, I've, I've met, I have brothers and sisters. I've met a brother. I've met my biological dad. Um, it's just been really intense for all parties involved. Wow. For, um, Cause they're definitely, you know, talk about spirituality. Yeah. Uh, we, we are in very different places and it, it's been very heartbreakingly beautiful, Sheena. Like just, it was the best, it was the most amazing eight days of my life. And, you know, but after that, it's just, everything just started to just like the fires in Maui right now just erupted. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's yeah. hard. It's interestingly enough, I've been on a very similar journey that you probably didn't know. And that I haven't talked a whole lot about, although God thinks, I think I talk about everything from my life out loud. Um, I, my mother was adopted. So her mother died when she was five and she spent seven years in the system in Kentucky during the depression. And then she was adopted by the folks I knew as my grandparents when she was 12. So her birth family I met one aunt who's now passed. All my aunts are passed. Um, my mom kind of wrote letters with them sometimes. I, I know one cousin in San Antonio, but we've never met, but we're Facebook friends. So mostly I did my 23andMe to find her family. Now, I was a donor baby from Yale's experimental program in the 60s. So I have no idea who my father is. And I never really cared. I just wanted to find her family and find out where she came from. Um, my mom swore I looked just like the obstetrician. So I grew up my whole life thinking I was half Irish and half Jewish. And my biggest fear when I opened that envelope was that my mother wasn't going to be Irish because so much of my identity is wrapped around being Irish. I'm like, what if it comes back and she's not? Well, the first thing I saw was 100% Irish on mom's side. And I'm like, okay, well, and then I'm looking at my dad's side and it says 100% Italian. And I'm like, what? what? And it was this whole, like, I never expected, right? I never had any connection, never expected. So unlike, unfortunately, unlike you, I didn't get any first cousins. I have like first cousin once removed to the closest, but almost all of them are on his side. And they're all very friendly until they realize I don't know who he is. And I think probably the word in the family is, you know, uncle so-and-so gave out sperm and we don't talk about it. So they kind of come in real hot and then they disappear. And on my mom's side, I've met some lovely people, but I think once we become Facebook friends and they realize that I'm a queer psychic and they're all in Kentucky, it's a deal breaker. So they all disappear. So basically mm -hmm. I've met all these great people and everyone has disappeared. 
And it's made me kind of realize that, that I don't really care. I would like to see one picture of him because mm-hmm. I just like to know what he looks like, but I mm-hmm. don't have any great herge now to pursue. And all I really wanted to know from my mom's family was more about the upbringing and more about the family mm-hmm. that I, that my mom didn't know because she was so much younger than the rest of them. Mm-hmm. Um, but now I kind of don't, I kind of really let it go because mm-hmm. it just, I realized that, you know, family is really the, what I, my best friend has a sign in her bathroom that says, friends are the family you choose for yourself. And I, I really have always felt that way, not even really ever having a family. And um, I still feel that way. Mm-hmm. And I think it's great when people have the wonderful success stories. Mm-hmm. Um, one of my best friends had that. He found the father he never knew. And now he's even changed his last name. And he's so happy. And all these cousins and they go there for Christmas. That was not my experience, but Mm -hmm. um, it sounds like yours is probably somewhere in between his and mine. Yeah, I would say that. I mean, it's very, I'm going to have to do something creative with it, Sheena. Like, I don't, I don't, I don't know if it's, uh, if it's a doc series or if it's a doc uh, or or I'm, I'm really, really tempted to write a book about it because it's just the, the dynamics of, you know, I just, how it affects everyone. Like my adopted mom, who I'm very close with now was not close to as a child. Right. I remember, but, that. but the, the pain that it caused for her, for me to find my birth mother, then how my birth mother felt about my adopted mother. It was like I was thrust into, so like my sister who I'm actually, so my first name is Sarah. My birth mom named her first, I guess her second daughter. I was the first Sarah as well. So I don't know how that I know. Yeah. Yeah. But, but, you know, I really, that has been the dynamic that has, made this I very difficult is is I was thrust into a family history and kind of ex, not expected but like almost like I I needed to like fit into that like I don't know if that makes sense but the drama that they already have <laughs> as a family right I have nothing to do with but I became part I almost felt like a an emotional pawn in a chess game because my aunt who my aunt and my birth mother do not get along. And, you know, it's just, it's been, I had to just step back because it felt like they were more concerned with their family drama than like getting to know me. Like, I can't believe you met her. I can't believe, well, she's my aunt. Of course. I want to know who she is. I want to meet her. Like, I don't have any, you know, I'm not in y'all's situation. And right. her daughter just like, you know, thought I was going to take her mom away and that I, you know, felt threatened by me and just, and it was just like heartbreaking for me, Sheena, because I just wanted, I just wanted to know my birth mother. I wanted to know what her favorite color was, like what I, just these basic things. And I think it was just really hard for me because she came to visit me on my birthday. Uh, So March 15th was my birthday. She was there in California. And, you know, it was just so I felt. I honestly felt when she told me how much she loved me and wanted me, it was the first time in my life I believed it. Mm. And that's significant. That's for me. That's that's just like. Just I've always had a hard time trusting people who say that they love me and just I don't know what it was, but she was when she talked about how much she always wanted me and how much she loves me. I just I felt it. And on my birthday, when she you know, she had brought me some very sweet things that had been in the family history, which I thought was really kind. Yeah, Um, she you know, you know me, I'm not very into the phone. I don't carry it around on me. I'm not, I like to interact organically as much as I can. 
I have a love hate with Facebook. I've had like nine accounts because I go like, I don't want to do it anymore for years. And then I'm back yeah. and then I yeah. hate it. Um, but I just, you know, she was on her phone a lot because her daughter, my sister, I guess felt threatened and kept texting her. And if my mom did not respond, the sister would be very upset. And so on my birthday, I said, all I want for my birthday is for you to just spend one day with me, just me, you know, and it not with our phones. Like let's, we're both into nature. She's very similar to me. We look alike. We sound alike. We're both five, three, you know, it's just, yeah. she definitely looks like a, my sister and, and we just have a lot of fun together. And I was like, I want to just go hang out with no phones and just, and she couldn't do it. And, and that was the first red flag for me, Sheena, where I was like, I need to be careful. Cause like I'm, when I'm around her, I'm a nine-year-old again. I'm the eight-year-old again, who, who desperately wants to connect with this person who honestly, since leaving California, doesn't want anything to do with me. Told, told me through an Instagram message through this daughter that uh, she didn't want anything to do with me because, you know, of whatever reasons. And so it's just been, because you know, I, I don't know what, I mean, whether it's because I talked to her sister that she isn't, you know, whatever reasons, but I, I just, I couldn't believe after all that time that, that she could use those words and, and say that she was done with me. And I just, I don't know if my heart could ever like, she's tried to reach out a couple times and I just, I don't know. Like, I just, I can't, the, I, it's been the constant me pursuing and saying, Hey, let's spend time together. Let's go do that. And the next thing I see is her Facebook cover page is her and Sarah wearing matching outfits together, posing on the beach. And it's like, yeah, that, that hurts. I can't, I can't, I can't put myself through that. It's too painful. Yeah. Yeah, too it's, painful. It's, it's a hard situation, I think, no matter what. Do you mm -hmm. know what I mean? I mean, so I had the opposite experience from you. See how similar our lives have always been. Yeah, right? always, 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 always. My mother was date raped when she was 25, and my grandparents made her put the baby up for adoption. She went into a home for unwed mothers in Harlem, and... um Basically, she had had a problem with bleeding after the birth. And while she was out of it, they signed the papers and had the baby taken away. And my mother carried that with so much shame. So funny, my whole life, my mom and I told each other everything. She always said, there's two things I have to tell you someday. And I'm terrified. The first was that my legal father was not my birth father. And I already knew that when I was five. And I didn't care. So that was easy. And I was secretly hoping, like, please. Please, a nice Italian on 23 and me. Um, the second thing was this, and she didn't tell me till I was 25. And she cried the whole time. And my mom was, you know, a tough woman who survived the depression and didn't cry all the time because of all the shame she had been put through surrounding being raped at 25 after being drugged as a virgin, getting pregnant being in this home for unwed mothers. They only let her come home one day for Christmas and they made her stay in the attic and they made her wear a big coat and try to hide. I mean, oh yeah, yeah, did, right? yeah. So I, like the foolish idealistic Aries that I am, encouraged her to go and find my sister. And after a couple of years, she did. And it was the opposite where my, I've, ne I've never talked about this publicly. So you're the first one, my friend. My sister showed up and was extremely antagonistic towards me and very, very angry. And I didn't understand what was going on. She would do weird things like I was doing the vagina monologues in Manhattan and I got her tickets to come and she never came. And then she called my mom and told my mom like, oh, well, she ignored me and never gave me those tickets. And I'm like, and then my mom got mad at me. Like, why are you trying to shut her out? And I'm like, what are you talking about? So with little things like that, right? So then she caught herself in a couple of those things. And my mom realized what was going on. But one night I was out at a club with some friends and I was telling the story and the woman I was sitting next to 
was also adopted and had found her mother and was had was in a complete antagonistic relationship with her sister. And she said, well, how would you feel if you finally found your mother? And then there was this other girl that got your mother their whole life. And I was thinking, I'd just be thankful I found my mother. But apparently, you know, it's a thing that sometimes adopted kids are very resentful of the siblings who've been there the whole time. And sometimes the siblings who've been there the whole time are resentful of the adopted kids. So I dealt with exactly what you dealt with um, on the other end of that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And what, what wound up happening was after about a six months or a year, there was just no contact with her. And that's really okay with me mm -hmm. because she just wasn't very nice, mm -hmm. sadly. She yeah. probably watch this someday and I'll get a nasty email, but okay. <laughs> um, <laughs> okay. Me too. Um, but, yeah. You both of us, we're going to, we're going to commiserate when the emails come in. <laughs> but you know what, you know, we, you, I mean, I don't know why your sister's like that. I don't know if maybe she didn't know this whole time or what her problem is. She knew, she knew she was by the, by the time that she could understand it, my mom told her. And yeah. at first, when we first found out about each other, because I was adopted and an only child and she is the only girl. So at first it was like, oh my God, we're sisters. We got, we like got matching like little butterfly necklace. It was like when you said it came in really hot and fast, you know, yeah. like, oh my God, a sister, a sister sending sweet yeah. songs and like, and, and, you know, I just think that it goes back to, to that. The one thing she said to me in the beginning, she's like, I'm used to being the only daughter okay. and, and just, I, I, I don't know what it is. She, I, I think that when my mom spent those eight days with me, it was, I've always been very, you know, pro mental health, talk right. about things, mm -hmm. you know, if you have depression, I mean, I did 23 and me, like I got depression. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> I take medication for depression. I'm not ashamed of that. Right. And I battled with anxiety for a long time. And I've, I don't, but in South Carolina, you know, some people don't believe that mental illness is really a thing. And when I was with my mom, it, there was some serious signs of depression and anxiety. And she even told me, she's like, I first had a panic attack when your grandfather, my dad, like I woke up from having a C-section thinking that you would be there. And you were gone. I never yeah. got to hold you. He same just, thing. yep, same. Yeah. Thing. Mm -hmm. And she said, that's when my panic attack started because he moved me to South Carolina from Louisiana. And so she spoke to me about her anxiety. She spoke to me about not being able, waking up in the middle of the night with worry and, you know, crying. And so when she left California and everything just kind of blew up for whatever reason, everything was great. And then it was like, not great. I, t I finally told my sister I, about a month ago, I said, I don't care what happens between you and myself, but please look, please get her. You know, and I told that to my mom, I'm like, please just see someone about depression. If anything comes from this, like I, you shouldn't cry every day and wake up with worry. And, and I, and it's like, and like my sister's like, there's nothing wrong with my mom. You know, my mom is perfectly fine. And that's when I was just like, right. goodbye. Like I, it was really Sheena. Like that's the first time in my life I've ever like just typed goodbye. And like, that was it. Like, I, I'm just like, goodbye, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you know, because that, you know, it breaks my heart because that is my birth mom. And I know me and I know the connection we had over those days. And I know she struggles with that. And I just, I hope that one day that she will be open to taking something for depression or anxiety and, and not be ashamed of it. Like, I mean, it's, it's just yeah. really, it's, a, it's, no. yeah, it's a uh, bitter it's so sweet. Past between mothers and daughters. I oh, have yeah. anxiety. 
Yeah. It's so commonly passed that way. Yeah. And yeah, it's so 1990 it to be embarrassed about depression. I mean, if I don't, if you're not on a medication or a supplement that helps with that. I... <laughs> right. Right. Yeah. No, I, I a hundred percent agree, but I also think that, and I don't think it's, I mean, I think regionally, yeah, there are certain regions in this country that have a lot of work to do to yeah. catch up, but I also think it's just individual families. I mean, you'll find mm -hmm. people right here in Los Angeles that don't believe in that. You know what I mean? It's, it's, um, either you're expanding your mind and you're growing or you're not. And some people don't want to, and it's very hard for someone to break out of their situation out of away from the people that they know. Yeah. And I think that's what happened is because I told her when she left, I said, you know, cause we did so much kind of work ourselves. Like it was very intense. Like she told me things she's obviously not really ever shared with anyone. Like, yeah. you know, and there were wounds that were opened for both of us. And I told her when she left, I said, you're going back to South Carolina to a situation. So my grandfather, who basically stole me from her, mm -hmm. sold me to mm -hmm. this adopted family. Sure. sure. Um, she now takes care of because he has dementia and he's 92. And mm -hmm. she takes care of him. And what I told her when she left was, I was like, look, let's plan some time that you and I could just like, we'll go to Bora Bora. We'll go to somewhere and just like spend a week together and just like get to know each other away from all of the family dynamics. Because I can't really navigate through it until I have built something solid and a foundation with you. That's, that's what our conversation was, you know? Right. And I think just, I didn't have an expectation, but Sheena, honestly, my hope was, is that we would be able to spend time together. She would meet Michelle. She would be, she didn't even know what hummus was. Like she's yeah. never been outside the country. Like yeah. I want, yeah. she made a bucket list of like all the things she wanted to do. And I was like, I'll try take you hummus. to go do. Yeah. Try hummus. I'll take you to these places. And right. I've been all over the world. And I, I had this, like when I was a kid that I fantasized about what she would be like, I started that like, Oh my God, we're going to get to travel and I'll get to show her new things. And like, you know what I mean? And I think that no one in her life in South Carolina wants her to experience that. I really feel like they want her to stay right where she is, right with them. Yeah. And I got to let it go. I got to, I, I had to just let her go. And it's, so it's been, that's why I think I need to do something creative with it. Cause it's so new. This just happened. And, you know, I just, just part of the process of, of healing that is being able to write about it or, you know, do something with my creativity about it. Yeah. Don't you think though, that there's, it's almost like when there's a group of addicts and one person gets sober and they try to pull that person back in when, when people are in a place where they're not energetically expanding and somebody has the opportunity to do it. It's like families that discourage their kids from going to college. Oh, you don't need college. None of us went to college because yeah. they don't want anyone to leave that cycle. Yeah. The circle and the cycle, right? Yeah. Of what, yeah. what happens over and over and over again. And if she broke the cycle, then I think your sister, who I think has, if I may speak plainly, openly on the air, has a little bit of a narcissism problem. Yeah. yeah. Um, would have been upset because suddenly then, your mom would have done things she's never done and your mom would have done things without her. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So yeah. that those two things were absolute no, no's. Oh yeah. And I, I yeah. think that happens. You know, I, I don't know about you cause you and I sort of have this have always right. Both had this dual life as, as creators and as healers. Mm -hmm. And for me, my healer part was on the down low. And now I kind of wear my underwear on the outside. and It's all out there for people to see. But in my life, in my personal life, um, I have seemed to have again and again run into these situations where I meet this person who, for whatever reason, is very much a soulmate. Mm -hmm. And then there is another person who does not want us to be connected in whatever way 
and literally pulls them away. And that Mm -hmm. has happened to me in romance. It's happened in friendships. It's happened in work. It happened in family with my sister, but I'll put that in quotes Mm -hmm. um, because I have not seen the DNA yet. (laughs) Um, You know, and and every time I'm so heartbroken. Mm -hmm. And this healing journey that I've been on this last year, because I don't know if you know, but but I moved into my childhood home and I was going to just come down here and fix it up and rent it. And I fell in love with my mom's energy everywhere and I stayed. So oh. now I'm mostly here at the beach and sometimes in the city. And um, it's given me a lot of time to go back and think about everything from mm-hmm. when I was 13 and we moved here forward. And I've realized this is a pattern. And I think that it's probably something a lot of people deal with. But especially when I think you're a healer, you, you know, you find these situations with these little bits of, of energetic perfection. Mm -hmm. And then some darkness swoops in and sucks it away. And I'm not sure why it happens, but I do know there's a lot of us on the earth that it happens to again and again and again. Yeah. Yeah. And some, and I think energetically it's the balance of darkness and light in the universe, right? Yeah. Because all the wonderful things that you and your mom could do and the amount of healing Mm -hmm. that it could bring to you both. I mean, both of you, she might not need meds anymore. No. She might not need meds anymore. No. <laughs> to just really have that relationship. Yeah. Yeah. And there has to be something standing in the way. Yeah, it's true. I mean, it's like uh, it's spiritual. It's like every great story, screenplay, movie. But I think that you're right about the healer kind of energetic journey because I feel like from from the time I first started traveling to other countries to really study, whether it was in Costa Rica with a shaman or it was India on an ashram, like I've always, that has always been the forefront of everything in my life. Yeah. And so for those, for those eight days, so much healing took place and so much, I I mean, I can't even explain it. It was just such a a beautiful flow of just healing, healing. And you're right. It's, it's, I think it's darkness, but I, I, I think darkness is fear because everything that happened during those eight days was unconditional. It was like, even on that day with my birthday and we worked through that, like it was another layer of working through something. Sure. And and when she got back to to this small town uh, around my grandfather, around uh, a, a man that is not very healthy for her, if I may well, just be technically, <laughs> technically back to the abuser. Right. Back to the, yeah, yeah. the one who caused the problem in the first yeah, place. Yeah. And all these other things and just the town in general, just, you know, kind of. um you know, it went from being this like beautiful healing connected thing to her telling my, my biological dad that I drugged her and that I'm crazy. And, you know, things that I know you have dealt with because of whatever things that you have and you bring to a connection, maybe that person, like, I I don't know, but it's, I've come so far in my life and my healing and, and who I surround myself with and my esteem that, you know, I don't doubt who I am. I know who I am. I know I'm a good person. I know what I have to offer. And, you know, I, there's just, there's, there's now a no tolerance rule for uh, cruelty. Um, And so, yeah. And it's been honestly, Sheena, it's been empowering to have to, come through that you know what i mean to to have to now heal and work through you know just kind of what happened after that time period we spent together and uh yeah and then you drugged her i mean it's it's almost like (laughs) she was punishing you for how much she cares about you yeah and punishing you for how much she feels about you yeah and i think that is something that first of all i see it every day in my spiritual practice yeah multiple times a day but in my own life i'll just speak about me yeah i've been in situations where i have had the most beautiful connections with another human being and either it scared the shit out of them 
yeah. or it scared the shit out of somebody in their life and they made yeah. them feel bad about yes. it. Yes. And then suddenly it's, oh, well, are you like bewitching me? Yeah. You put a spell on me. <laughs> oh, I hypnotized her. I hypnotized her. I did that did. too. Of course you did. Right. Because <laughs> we know that all directors are expert in right. hypnosis. That's how they get good performances. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's, and I think it, they have, they're looking for that external bad thing yeah, yeah. that caused the fact that the, the connection that she felt to you mm -hmm. just made her feel out of control. It, but you just, it yeah, did. yeah. It made it, you feel out of control when you really, really connect to somebody you have a soul yeah. tie with in any capacity, mm -hmm. it blows your mind. It yeah. blows you out of your body a little bit and it's a little scary. Yeah, but, yeah. But you have to just learn how to live with it till you get back in your body and you yeah. get used to the feeling and then everything becomes okay. But yeah. some people become very fearful. And I think people like you and me who, for whatever reason, love with reckless abandon, mm -hmm. I will blame my mother for me because she taught me to love that way and she loved me that way. Mm -hmm. But some people just know how to do that. Mm -hmm. um, that people are very fearful of that. Mm -hmm. Because yeah. most people are not taught to love like that. And right. Most people are not, um, they're scared of anything that makes them feel out of control. And I mm -hmm. think all the guilt she carried all those years and then yeah. meeting you and thinking it was going to be some cute little social, yeah. you know, thing you could put on your Facebook. Yeah. And then it became this incredible soul yeah. bond where she literally wanted to pack some stuff in a handkerchief and put it over your shoulder with a stick and follow you around the world. Right. It made her feel very out of control that yeah. there was this potential in her to become more than she is mm -hmm. inspired by a piece of her that she made. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, to me, that's perfect synchronicity spiritually. Yeah. yeah. But I just think it scared the shit out of her. And oh, I yeah. think for people like us, we, I don't know about you, but I always feel like I'm sitting alone in the sandbox, like, ah, shit, I scared the fuck out of somebody yeah. else. <laughs> I'm too intense for another no. one. Oh. oh everybody again. <laughs> and every time I think I'm going to back the intensity off, and then I look around and I'm in the damn sandbox, and I'm like, I scared everybody again. <laughs> so I think we become very PTSD about that. Yeah. Right? About that yeah. feeling. Yeah. Like, wow. Yeah. And and the reckless abandon that you talk about, because yeah. you have to be very, you know, I mean, it's, I, I'm so glad that we got to talk about this because I, it's so important to have, you know, some people it's like the most important thing to them is love or passion or money or artistry or mine has always been to just be understood. You don't even have to like me or agree with me, but just right. to, to, to be understood is such a recognition. And every time I talk to you, I just, it's so healing for me because you get it, you know? Right. And it's like, I don't, you know, I, I don't have to, to say much of the story because it's like you, you, and, and that's family, that's friends. And, and you need those types of people when you are when you are psychic when you are a healer when you are a medium all of those things that i am and and not totally yes. out with yet but about yes. to be um right. but you have come out on my show a couple i times. i have come out we've on your show some, i have we've had I have. some good ones on my show about it oh yeah. yes that that is true um I, but i always that's why it's always so good to talk to you because i just i feel like I can share what I'm going through and you get it. And it makes me more almost confident in sharing it publicly, publicly, well, if that makes sense. And then, it, you know, in the, it, then it makes it okay for me to share mine and you to share yours. And somewhere there are people listening who need to share theirs. Yes. And that's yes. why I've been so open about everything with me, whether it's my, my psychic abilities or the fact that I don't know who my father is or, the fact that my mom didn't know who her father was, although now we do know because the 23 and me came in and her father actually was her father. So one of us knows the truth. Um, how close I was to her and how devastated I was by her death. Mm -hmm. um, growing up and discovering at 31 that I was intersex. I mean, all mm -hmm. of these things. Mm -hmm. I don't, I don't, when I was, <laughs> if you had told my 18 year old self that I was going to tell all this stuff to the world, I would have run and hid in the closet for 50 years. 
but I do <laughs> every one of those things I did because I realized that I grew up in a haunted house mm-hmm. somewhere. There was somebody who was scared to tell their story yes. and they needed someone to do it. And that's what I so admire about you, my friend, is that you are the same. You will tell the things that are not pretty mm-hmm. because, you know, out there, there's someone who needs to hear that and they need you. Yeah. And to me, we come to this planet to be in service. Do we come to learn our own lessons and get our poop in a group celestially? Absolutely. But those of us that are healers, we also come here to help others to heal. Mm -hmm. And sometimes just saying, oh, my God, I know all about that. And I went through that, too. Mm -hmm. Help somebody feel like it's okay to tell their story. And that they're not alone. I mean, that's always been my my big thing coming from a small town and really feeling different you know, and, and if I can say anything about what I've gone through and it makes one person like not feel completely isolated, then it's worth it. You know, to me, whatever I would have to deal with by sharing it, which I don't care anymore. I've hit pre-menopause. So I'm in the wisdom stage now. (laughs) I'm on hormone replacement therapy. So I'm in the, I'm in that zone of, I don't give a fuck what you think. You're becoming a juicy crone. (laughs) I am. I I am. My 50th birthday, (laughs) some feminist brought me a book called how to be a juicy crone. And I thought I was going to kill myself. But now I'm sort of like, <laughs> now I'm sort of getting into it. And I'm like, okay, I'll be a juicy crone if you yeah. need me to. But yeah. that's true. I think it's, um, you know, my mom used to always say 50 is 30 plus not giving a shit. And I, I think you do, you get to the point where you think, no, I'm just going to be honest. But, but now let yeah. me ask you this. Yeah. And this is something that my healing journey, something that I'm going through right now in this healing journey. So now you have met this person. Mm-hmm. that you thought about your whole life, not mm-hmm. just because she was your mother, I believe, but because unconsciously you felt that soul tie. Yeah. And not everybody has a soul tie to their birth mother. I mean, no. sometimes you have soul ties to somebody else. Yeah. So now you have it and you've mm-hmm. experienced it mm-hmm. and you know what it's like to be in her presence, mm-hmm. but now you know there's issues. Yeah. So where do you put, where do you put that? Where do you put that intensity and that soul tie and that feeling of knowing what it would be like to be with her all the time and be connected to her, knowing now that that connection is very staticky? Mm-hmm. How do you heal? Because the soul tie never goes away. Mm-hmm. You just figure out where to put it. Yeah. So yeah. are you thinking about that? Like, where am I going to put this so that I'm not white knuckling through every single day? but still acknowledge that it's a thing and send her all the love and light that she needs, you know? I'll tell you, and it's, I, like I said, I just put myself out there um, for five minutes a day at night, I light a candle and I talk to her and I just send love and hope that she's okay. Like, even though I can't physically talk to her right now, like I just, I do. I, that helps me. Um, I, did, <laughs> I did. I did write letters in the mail, but I'm not doing that anymore. My nine year old and I had to have a talk. Yeah, I think that's um, yeah. But just, you know, five minutes a day, kind of like what I feel like I want to share with her and what kind of love and unconditional kind of support on her journey I want to give. And it's, it's made me not white knuckle and it's made me not be so angry and, and horrified and upset. Yeah. It's a beautiful way to deal with it. It's a beautiful way to handle it. And then you just, you just kind of hope and pray, right? That I hope and pray. I hope and pray that maybe the sister will get married and her and her two kids can go <laughs> right. out of the small the town and have their own life. And then, right. and you just hope someday she comes back and realizes yeah. Yeah. Because you, you can, that's hope, it, right? That's hope. It's hope. And hope it, is it, good. it seems totally impossible to me, but maybe there's the 1% chance. It's, you it's know? not always impossible. I mean, I, I lost a friend, a very dear friend who was like my sister to the 2016 election. And I never thought we would be friends again. And then three or four years later, I was going through something really ugly with a really ugly person that needed to go from my life. And I went through this thing called the hatchet burying tour 
where I just, all these people where there had been problems, a lot of which I think because of that person, the bad yeah. influence, yeah. I just sent people an email and said, hey, how are you? Where are you? And I just sent her something and said, I don't even remember why we're mad at each other anymore, right. but let's not be. And she sent me something back saying, I don't remember either, but I love you. And now we're sisters again. Good. So um, time can heal. Time can heal. Yeah, it, it is doable that time mm -hmm. heals things. Yeah. And that perspective heals things. Yeah. And that's kind of part of the healing journey that I've been on this year is trying to assess. Is there anybody from my past that I do want to make that effort to get back into my life? Or are there people that just are gone and need to stay gone and and just healing? Because I, I mean, I'll tell you what started my journey. And I haven't talked about this either. A really weird thing happened many, 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 many years ago in my youth. I was very much in love with somebody that that I now believe was the love of my life. And I was living my life and trying to heal and dealing with what it feels like to be in my childhood home. And one day I went on Instagram to post something for my cat and the a hashtag came up and it was the only hashtag. You know, usually Instagram gives you 50. Mm -hmm. And it was that person's name. And I was like, what in the hell? Where did that come from? And it started me thinking. And I realized that because at the time it didn't work out for reasons out of our control and in our control and whatever, I, instead of dealing with it, I stuffed it down mm -hmm. and I put it away and I kept going with my life. Mm -hmm. But because there was that ball of, of non-healing stuck inside of me, like an abscess, right? Mm -hmm. I, in my life, made very bad decisions with a lot of people trying to make everybody that relationship. Mm. And so I had no idea until about three weeks ago that that's what had gone on for much of my adult life. And so now I'm trying to like really go through relationships of all different sorts and really healing. And I had a mm -hmm. very, very bad non, non relationship with my father. And even though my parents stayed together for 52 years, they hated each other and he barely spoke to either of us. One of the reasons I didn't want to move back in this house was because of his energy. But I found that living here the last year, I've been able to very much make peace with that relationship. And I never thought that would happen. So now I'm trying to make peace with every relationship mm -hmm. because you can't truly put it away mm -hmm. until you make peace with it. Right. True. And, True. You know, people like us that we work and we create and we thrive when something traumatic happens, we just go, Oh, and we stuff it down and we go to the next project and start mm -hmm. working. And we think because we're functioning, we're okay. Mm -hmm. But we haven't really dealt with that. Mm -hmm. And I think seeing my mom never having really dealt with my sister being taken away, mm -hmm. um, even after she came and wasn't great and nice, mm -hmm. still, mm -hmm. um, I don't want to be that person. I want to get through all of them, deal with all of them, yes. put them somewhere else so that in my future life, in love and in friendships and in family and in work, I am no longer attracting yes. that energy. Amen. Amen. You know? Amen. And while you were saying that right before that, when you were, we were talking about hope, I just have to tell you that I haven't seen one in so long and a hummingbird came right up to the window here. And that is go. such a beautiful sign to me because they are just such joyous creatures. And they were my mom's thing. I see them all the time. When she was here, when she lived in this house, she would sit in her easy chair by the screen door and there would be like six of them hovering outside the window. And I'd say, Mom, what are you doing? She's like, just hanging out with my hummingbirds. Aww. And when I first came here after she died to work through the house and take the things she loved and move them to my house in Los Angeles, one day, I, nobody came in or out of the house but me. And one day I went all the way upstairs to the back bathroom that was mine. I opened the closed door and there was a hummingbird sitting on the vanity light. I don't know how it got in the house. I don't know where it came from, it wouldn't leave. I had to like cut the screen out and pin it back so that when I left the house, it had somewhere to go. Mm -hmm. I see them all the time. When, when yeah. after she died, they would hover outside of my window where I was working. And you know, that studio was four stories up. Yeah. People would say, I've never seen a hummingbird up this high, but it's hummering outside the window. So what a, a hummingbirds are, what an amazing thing for you to see. Yeah. 
And it just shows our connection as always. Every time we talk, it's so like aligned. Uh, absolutely. Yeah. And you have to remember, sweetie, the connection with your mom is always there. Yeah. Even if she can't make it work in this lifetime and we pray that she does, yeah. it doesn't change the fact that it's there. And after this life is over and you're home for however long till you come back, you will be together again. And yeah. maybe next time she'll, she'll be different. She'll be yeah. better. She'll work on her stuff more. Yeah. But That's you can't hope. ever take that tie away, right? No. We, we send her so much light that she gets. So to much. Her. Yeah, absolutely. And that your sister marries somebody who gets transferred to Nigeria. <laughs> <laughs> and she's, she's not. <laughs> not around <laughs> right because i don't want to take her away i don't want to take my mom away from the grandkids i don't want to do that you know exactly you don't <laughs> you're hypnotizing the grandkids uh, yeah because god knows everybody that lives in la is a genie right exactly we're exactly. all hypnotizing the masses <laughs> we're all fruits and nuts <laughs> exactly right we're all looking for a way to manipulate someone absolutely what a joy. we need to do this on a regular basis please because I love being with you and I think you're terrific. And um, I think whatever little energetic thing goes on with us, it's groovy. And I'm glad you're I, my friend and I appreciate you. Me too. Um, where can people find you online and learn about all the exciting creative things that you're doing? Because you're always doing something and you're going to do something with this. Uh, just my name dot com. <laughs> No, not okay. just my name.com, Catherinebrooks.com. <laughs> type J U S. You're like just my name.com. And, and, and do you have social media at this point? Yes, I do. I do. I've, I, I've been doing TV again. So I've been promoting the shows and good. like getting it out there. So I'm, I'm back on it, mostly Instagram. Okay, yeah. good. Instagram yeah. is nice. Yeah, I it's like it. It's a little less crazy than Facebook. It's less drama, which I appreciate. <laughs> yeah, I like that too. All right. I love you, my friend. My best, love your you wife. Too. Okay. And I hope to see you both soon. Take care. All right. Well, Bye. Catherine Brooks, everybody. Until Bye. Uh, next time, <laughs> next week, next Friday at three o'clock Pacific time, uh, here's what you can do for me. Visit me at SheenaMetalSpiritual.com for all your psychic needs and to learn more about my entertainment life. SheenaMetalSpiritual.com. Please visit me there and also um, on social media at Sheena Metal. Till I see you next week, seek peace, live in love, lead with kindness, embrace unity, always work to raise your vibration and know that you are love and you are loved and you're loved by me. I'm Sheena Metal. This is the Sheena Metal Experience on KGRA Digital Broadcasting Network. And you know what? I'll see you next week.